Hi, I'm Lisa Marie Latino here with Lou Paper, author of Perfect, Don Larson's Miraculous World Series game and the men who made it happen. Hey Lou, how are you? I'm great, how are you doing today? So we are doing this at Mickey Mantle's restaurant. We actually have the backdrop of the perfect game behind us. So what made you decide to write a book about this? Well, I love to write and Don Larson's perfect game is one of the seminal events of baseball history. Everybody knows about it. It seemed to me though that the prior accounts were missing the human dimension. So I wanted to tell a story not only about Larson's game, and I was able to come up with a lot of new details, but also the stories of the 19 players who were on the field that day. Some of them are very famous, like Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Jackie Robinson, but a lot of the players are not very famous, uh, like Gil McDougall, uh, Joe Collins, uh, Jim Gilliam. And so I thought everybody's got a story, and I thought if you knew something more about the players, where they came from, uh, how they got to be on the field that day, and more importantly, what did they think of this great, miraculous game that Don Larson pitched. Now, how did you get to research and interview? I mean, obviously some of these players have, are deceased. They're so not here anymore. Can't talk to them anymore. Right. Um, but how did you, did you have access to Yogi and to Don to write this book? Yes, uh, I interviewed all of the surviving players. Uh, Don Larson. Uh, I had met Don uh, when I was at the Yankee Fantasy Camp, so uh, that was in part the inspiration because I was familiar with him talking about the game, certainly. And I talked to Yogi and all the surviving players, although Hank Bauer, who's the Yankee right fielder, died after I talked to him. Uh, but I did talk to all the surviving players, and I talked to a lot of the other players who were on the team, uh, but not on the field that day. And then for those players who have passed on, uh, I talked to their wives, their siblings, uh, their children, Roy Campanella's, uh, Gil Hodges, Pee Wee Reese, uh, Jackie Robinson. Uh, so I talked to them and they were able to give me a lot of stories and a lot of insight as well. Well, one of the most colorful, colorful Yankees was, of course, Mickey Mantle. We're at his restaurant today. Right. Tell us a funny Mickey story that you found in your research. Well, I'll tell you a funny Mickey story, and here's a, a story that just shows you the kind of guy Mickey Mantle was. This guy, I think, never really changed much. Uh, he was always a very humble guy, and uh, I don't think, even after he became very famous, I don't think he ever understood the attention that people showered on him. And uh, one funny story was, after he'd been playing with the Yankees a couple of years, he became, even before he had won his Triple Crown, he uh, was attracting a lot of national attention, and the Chicago Tribune decided to uh, authorize a book, a biography, the Mickey Mantle story. And they sent uh, a reporter down to Commerce, Oklahoma, to talk to the, Yankee cent the famous Yankee center fielder. And when the reporter met up with Mickey, he was incredulous. And he said, you mean to say the Chicago Tribune paid your expenses all the way down to Oklahoma just to talk to me? So, I mean, that just shows you the kind of guy he was. What shocked you when doing this research? You know, whether it be with Yogi, whether it be with the Dodgers, it's what, like, shocked you? What was the one thing that you learned from all this? How uh, nervous uh, the Yankees, a lot of the Yankees were on the field. Uh, we thought it was an important game. Uh, but Joe Collins, who is a veteran uh, Yankee first baseman, had been with the club for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And here was a guy who said, this was the most intense game he ever played in his entire 10-year history with the Yankees. Hank Bauer, here's a guy who was an ex-Marine, survived battles in Okinawa uh, and Guam and, and the Pacific Theater during the war, was an eight-year veteran with the Yankees, was so nervous uh, when Carl Ferrillo came up in the top of the ninth. Don Larson's uh, no-hitter is on the line, the Yankee game is on the line, and there's Hank Bauer, this guy who seemed as strong as they come, and is saying to himself, whatever you do, don't hit the ball to me. Please don't hit the ball to me. And I'm thinking, that was incredible to see that these guys, they may seem strong when you're watching them on television. They may seem they're taking it all in stride. But they, too, have nerves uh, just like the rest of us. And uh, the other interesting thing w that I found was the attitude of the Dodgers. Uh, the Dodgers had had only one no-hit game pitched against them in the post-World War II era. And even when they were down to their last out, the Dodgers were circulating in the dugout saying, we can beat this guy, we just got to get somebody on base. They could not believe that they would be the victims of a no-hitter, let alone a no-hitter pitched by Don Larson. So the guys in the dugout were still thinking they could beat the Yankees at that point. And so Clem Labine 
looks over to Roger Craig and says, what do you think, if Don Larson succeeds in doing this, it'll be something we'll never ever see again in our lifetimes. And Roger Craig turns around to, uh, to him, notwithstanding that they are desperate to, the Dodgers are desperate to win the game, and says, I hope he does it. And Clem Labine says, you know what, I hope he does it too. And that was kind of shocking to me as well to see that here are two Dodger players who are hoping that uh, the rival Yankees beat them in this pivotal fifth game of the 1956 World Series. Sportsmanship at its best, I guess. There you go. People who understood the importance of history. Now, and speaking of history, um, why don't you tell everybody who's watching Don Larson, because you had said, you know, maybe it was kind of improbable for someone like Don Larson to be pitching a perfect game against the Dodgers. Describe his career before that day. Well, Don had had a very uh, mixed career. He had started with the St. Louis Browns, moved on to the Baltimore Orioles. At one point where the Orioles had won three games and lost 21, but two of those three victories were against the Yankees. And when he joined the Yankees, he started to have some success. Uh, and so, and during the 1956 season, he had started using a no wind-up delivery in the last month of the season, and he had won four straight games. And I think that's what inspired Casey Stengel to start him in the second game of the World Series. And so Don Larson started the second game of the 56 World Series, but he did not do well. And Casey Stengel took him out uh, in the second inning because he had given up a hit and four walks. So Larson, like his teammates, thought that he would never be pitching again in the 56 World Series because the Yankees had a lot of other pitchers that Stengel could draw upon. But uh, and then Larson found out for some reasons that Casey Stengel never really explained, he decided to call Don Larson back and pitch that fifth game, which surprised Larson as well as his teammates. Casey has had a hunch. Casey Stengel was like that. A lot of people said he, they thought that he uh, consulted some kind of crystal ball in making a lot of uh, decisions. He would do uh, some very crazy things. Well, Lou, thank you very much for giving us some insight on the eve of Game 1 of the ALCS. And uh, hopefully your next book will be about the improbable 2009 Yankees World Series victory. That would be great, except it won't be improbable. I think people will say it was about time. It is about time. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And everybody, make sure you check out the book. It's called Perfect, Don Larson's Miraculous World Series Game and the Men Who Made It Happen. And this is Lisa Marie Latino for the Yankee Princess.net.